Some other words that we didn't get to, just so y'all know. Uh, snatched, bet, let him cook, NPC, shook, stand, tea, yeet, receipts, gas, shade, ghosted, high key, and salty. And we didn't get to them. That's okay. Here you go. You can have my Gen Z list. All right. YT. Hey. Appreciate y'all so much. What's up, y'all? I haven't seen you guys in three weeks. I don't know if it felt like a long time to you. It felt like a long time to me. We had Friendsgiving, then we had Thanksgiving, and then last week was a leader week, and now y'all are back in the house to continue this series. Right after Friendsgiving, we had hockey night. For those of you that came, thank you so much. We brought 70 people to go see the Ice Flyers and eat some pizza together. It was super fun. It was flawless. It went off without a hitch, and a lot of that is because y'all are such good students. So give yourself a round of applause. Thank you so much. Now we are on our series, Adventures Unlimited. It's about Advent. It's about the tenets of Advent. So far, we have talked about hope and peace. Now this week, we're going to talk about love. Aw, it is cuffing season. So we're going to talk about love. Cuffing season is when everyone gets in a relationship because they want a present from somebody on Christmas through Valentine's Day. And then when Valentine's Day passes, everybody breaks up and they're like, nah, I'm good. Hot girl summer. Uh. Anyway. So love, love, love is an incredible, incredible word. I love love, and the truth is, love as a word, as a single word, carries so much depth and so much meaning and so much variance in definition. For example, if I say I love ice cream, that love is not the same if I say I love God. Or if I say I love you as a friend, like one of my bros, I'm like, bro, I love you, that's not the same love that I feel for my spouse. Love is one word that has multiple depths, multiple applications, multiple meanings in the English language. Anyway, so I don't know if you guys know this, but the Bible was not written in English. I don't know if that's a shocker to anybody. I know, it was originally written in Greek and Hebrew and Sumerian, which are three languages that are not English. Well, in the Greek text, all the words that we see as love in our translations, there's actually four different words that were used for that. And those four different words make up four different types of love with different depths and different definitions that we can only define as a single word, love. So I want to go through those real quick. Here's a little Greek lesson for you. If you want to learn some Greek, you want to impress somebody at your next Bible study, break this out. So the first type of love is called eros. Y'all say eros. Eros is that sensual romantic, physical, only between a husband and wife type love. Eros. That's that good love that y'all will experience much later in life once you get married. Eros. The second is philia. Y'all say philia. philia. This is that most general type of love. This is like brotherhood or humanity or compassion. It's when you care about people as a whole. It's respect. It's wanting to do something for people in need. It's what you would say to your homie. It's that kind of love. Brotherly love, brotherly instincts. The third type is called storge. Y'all say storge. Storge is familial love. Who here has a brother or sister? It's that kind of love. All my leaders, how many of y'all got kids? It's that kind of love. It's that familial love, that love that only comes with sharing blood with somebody. That is storge. And then the last type of love, which you may have heard about because it's often preached about, is called agape. Y'all say agape. Agape that's that one right there. That's that love that's held higher and more prominent than any other love in the Bible. It's a term that defines God's love for his people. It is immeasurable, it is incomparable, and it's his love of humankind. It's divine, and it comes directly from God. It is perfect, it is unconditional, it is sacrificial, and it is pure. You see, love is one of the most powerful emotions that a human can experience. For Christian believers, love is the truest form of genuine faith. And that's what I wanna talk about today. Throughout the Bible, we discover how to experience love in many, many forms, and we are meant to experience it the way God intended us to. But before I get any deeper into love, I actually wanna talk about another L word, and that word is light. So behind me, if you could turn down the lights and put up an image, I got a map I want to show you guys. Can we turn down the lights? Turn them down. Little by little. Maybe sort of. All right, probably not. Okay, so behind me is a light map, and I hope you guys can see it enough. Can y'all break that out enough? There we go. Look at that. Figured it out. Hey, round of applause for our students running the lights. 
All right, so what we see over here, this is where I grew up, in a magical place called New Jersey. I grew up right here. You notice there's a lot of lights, a lot of lights. And I went to school in Maryland. Y'all can see over me for a second. All the lights. Well, shortly after I graduated from college, I went to another not so magical place, the magical land of New Mexico. Well, if you notice over here, there aren't so many lights. Well, here's why I bring that up. See, when I grew up in New Jersey, when I grew up on the East Coast, when I went to school in Maryland, I didn't realize how bright the lights around me were at all times. I didn't understand what light pollution was. I didn't know that I had lights illuminating my streets. I didn't know that the sky didn't have that many stars because it was so, so, so bright. But when I went to New Mexico for the first time, the darkness was almost deafening. I remember standing out in the street and being like, what is going on? Why can I see so many things in the sky? I didn't understand this map. But my goal today is before you leave, I want you to think, man, I should be more like New Jersey and less like New Mexico. So just tuck that away and we will get back to that. All right, you can turn the lights back up, put my slide back on the screen. Thank you very much. All right, so let's talk about light. Let's talk about what light represents in the Bible. Number one, light is used to represent Jesus himself. He's described as a light who will come to illuminate the world and save mankind from the darkness. You can find that in John 1, verse 5 through 9. And God's essential nature is light, and therefore Jesus' essential nature is light as well. He is the light of the world, and he will return and offer his light to people. Light is also utilized to direct and instruct throughout the Bible. You can go look up Psalm 119, verse 105. God's word describes light as a lamp to our feet to guide our path. It's pure. It helps us move forward. It is prudent to continue reading God's word to get advice so that he can continue to be a lantern to our feet and a light to our path to help us take our next steps in life. And in a more literal sense, Moses followed a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and used that light to guide him to the promised land. Light is also used to show power over darkness. John 1 verse 5 says that light has overcome the darkness. This is to say that all children of light have now overcome the enemy. And they have the power and the authority of Jesus to wage war against hell. The light has illuminated all evil and has overcome so that people do not have to live in fear because they know that they got Jesus on their side and he already won the battle. And then the last major thing that light represents in the Bible is Christians are represented as the light of the world. Christians have been urged to be the ambassadors of Christ on earth by shining the light that was first given to them by him. They could shine this light through their actions, how they live their lives, through their words. A Christian may be the only Bible somebody gets to read. So the way that you live, the righteousness, the choices you make should reflect the light of Jesus that he first gave you. By showing the love of Jesus, you can then be the light of Jesus. And today, that's what I wanna focus on, that last point as we continue week three of this series, Adventures Unlimited. So if you have your Bible or you have your Bible app, I'd like you to turn to 1 John 2, and we're gonna read verses seven to 11. I'll give you all a second to get there. That's my boy. No, literally, that's my son that was crying. Just for those of you that don't know. 1 John 2, verses seven to 11. My translation in my scripture is ESV, you may read whatever you like. They share common threads, but if you want word for word with me, it's the ESV translation. All right, let's get that on the screen behind me. Awesome. It starts, beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing you. Possibly one of the most confusing statements I've ever read in my entire life. It says, no, what I'm writing to you isn't new. In fact, it's old. It's so old, it's been with you from the beginning, but, but also at the same time, it's brand new. So let me break that down and make it make sense for you. The commandment that John wrote of was at the same time old, as in it's been preached to these people their entire lives, and new in a sense that it's called a new commandment by Jesus himself in John 13, 34, when he says, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The new commandment of love is necessary because of the darkness that marks humanity. 
So although the Jews has heard this commandment of old and been spoken to about love in previous scripture, the Gentiles are just now beginning their walk with Christ. The Gentiles are just learning about the one true God. And for all of them, even if they had heard this commandment before, the context just shifted because for the first time, the true light has illuminated the entire world in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. So it is an old commandment, but it is made so, so new. Continues in verse nine, it says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him, there is no cause for stumbling. So now he examines us according to our love for other Christians as a measure of our walk with God himself. Let me say that again slower. Our love for other Christians is a measure of our walk with God. And let me explain that further. Just as your relationship with sin and our obedience to resist it is a measure of your fellowship with God, so too is your love for God's people. If we say we are in the light, yet we hate our brothers and sisters, then our claim to fellowship with God is empty and vapid. But the one who does love his brother shows that he abides in the light. Well, here's the cold, bold, honest truth. God's people, aka Christians, most of y'all, aren't always the best example of Christ. Sometimes it's easy to think that following Jesus would be a lot easier if it weren't for Christians. And I've been there before too. But there's a reason that we feel that way. Christians, by sake of being a Christian, are not made whole, are not perfect, are not fully healed. And many Christians walk around wounded. They carry past hurt, past troubles, present hurt, peasant troubles, present issues. Often, they're even crippled by the scars left on them by other Christians. So when I, as a Christian, meet another Christian, I might choose suspicion over trust because I know what other Christians have done to me. I have wounds that I carry on. But the measure still stands. If we can't love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, then we have no way to claim a real love for God himself. Our relationship with God can and is measured by our love for each other. And it's a double-edged sword when it comes to Christians. Because on one hand, if I meet a Christian, it's easy to have common ground. Because I feel like I share values. I share a walk. I share a God. I share a lot of things with that person. And that's good. But if I flip that blade to the other side, the other edge tells me, ah, but, but, but I don't know because I expect more out of them. So it's easier for me to see when they slip. It's easier for me to see their faults because I know how a Christian should act, should move, should look, and the second they don't, I'm ready to call it out. It's a double-edged sword when we talk about loving other Christians. Verse 11 continues, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. And this point is plain English. If we lose love, we lose everything. There's nothing left without love. You can do all the right things, believe all the right truths, and if you don't love others, you're still lost. It's all too easy when you're a Christian to place ministry and being right above loving people. And ministry is important. And pointing people to truth and to what is right is important. But if you don't do it in love, you lost it. It's a perfect example of how you can be so, 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 so right in what you say and so, 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 so wrong in how you deliver it. And when you put those two things together, do you think you're right or you're wrong? You're wrong because they didn't hear you in the first place. We pick back up in verse 11, it says, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Knowing the importance that Jesus placed on our love for each other, John goes as far to say that if we hate our brother, we're basically walking in darkness. You know, we've been blinded. If any of you have ever been in the woods at night, it's real easy to walk on the path when your flashlight works. The second the flashlight goes out, it's real easy to trip and stumble and lose your way. And here's the tough part. Hatred and disdain isn't just an active emotion. It can also be a passive one. Hatred can be expressed by indifference, by inaction, and by complete ignorance, not just by your out outward actions of disdain and hate. John makes a direct correlation between our claim to be in the light and our love for one another, which makes love the litmus test for our walk with Christ. If we harbor hatred, we're still in the darkness. But if we love our brothers and sisters, we abide in the light, 
and we get to experience fellowship not only with each other, but with God. So what's the application and how does this come full circle to me? Well, before I get into my three big takeaways that I want you to write down, I have a question for you. When Jesus was pressed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they thought they had him cornered and they thought they were gonna catch this man who was holier than now stumbling, when they cornered him and they said, hey, Jesus, out of all the commandments, all the laws, everything we've been given by God, what is the most and greatest commandment? Who knows what he said? Raise your hand and I will call on you if you know the greatest commandment. Yes. And second and equally as important, Love that. So if you couldn't hear him, he said, love Lord God with all your heart, all your might, all your heart, all your might, all your mind. And second, equally important is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The great commandment is the same word we've been talking about all day, which is love. It's love. That's the great commandment. But after you're told what the great commandment is, at least the question in my mind is how, how do I carry that out? Because some people aren't easy to love. Your neighbor may not be easy to love. Your enemy definitely isn't easy to love or they wouldn't be your enemy. But your love cannot be a respecter of persons. And that's where it becomes difficult. Here's what I want to ingrain in you tonight. Love is on a spectrum. And it's not the spectrum you think it is. Love isn't on a spectrum of how much or how little you can love somebody. Because it's plain English. It says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if I love myself X amount, I need to love all people X amount. So the spectrum isn't the amount of love. I want to challenge that. I want to flip it on its head. And I want to tell you that the spectrum that love comes on is the distance at which you love somebody. There is a direct, finite distance at which you can love somebody best. It will vary. It will change. And in any given time, there is a single distance at which you can love someone most adequately. And I want to give you some examples in case you don't pick up what I'm trying to put down. Who here has ever had a best friend that was more like family? Who here has lost a best friend that is more like family and doesn't even speak to him anymore? Then y'all are going to understand what I'm about to say. Y'all can put your hands down. I guarantee that if you would have managed the distance at which you loved them throughout that process, they would still be in your life. And the good news is there's probably still a way to redeem it if you listen to what I'm about to say. When everything is high and to the right in a relationship, everything is good, there's no issues, there's no troubles, there's no turbulence, there's no tension, there's just positive interactions, you can love someone right here. You can love them up close. You can spend every day with them. Spend all your free time with them. Call them when you wake up. Call them when you go to bed. Like they could be this close to you, like family. And that's fine. But eventually there's issues. Eventually there's tensions and sometimes y'all just grow apart and that's okay. But you try to continue to love them like this and then it makes issues and it makes tensions. And when someone is this close and all they do when they're this close is make you mad, you cannot love them best. And you have to choose the distance to love them from in that season in order to love them at all. Love is on a spectrum of distance. If constantly being around somebody does nothing but frustrate you, it blocks your ability to love them. But if you take a step back, you increase your ability to love them. It's like a magnifying glass, and I'm going to tell you what I mean. Who here has ever tried to set something on fire with a magnifying glass? Okay, so let's say you have a magnifying glass, and you catch that beam of light, and you hold the magnifying glass too far from a leaf. What happens? Nothing. You hold it too close to a leaf. What happens? Nothing. You find that perfect distance where you see that little circle go whoop, 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 and then it gets like super small, and then you can burn a hole in the leaf. It's that perfect distance to set that leaf on fire. But there's only a single distance at a single time of day with the direction of the sun that you will hit that perfect point. Your love is no different. You are a magnifying glass, they are the leaf, and love is God's light, and you gotta focus yourself at the perfect distance in order to have the strongest effect of love on them. It doesn't always have to be up close. It is healthy to set boundaries. It is healthy to step back. It is healthy to distance yourself in order to love somebody best. Our command is not to love all people up close. It's to love everybody like we love ourselves. And if the distance or the closeness that you have someone is giving you an inability to love them at all, you missed it. Set your boundaries, set your distance, learn to love them best. So here is my big three takeaways. And if you haven't written anything down yet, I implore you to write these three things down. And they're gonna be on the screen behind me as I speak. 
Lesson one, embrace the commandment of love. Actively embrace the commandment that has been laid before you to love one another. It's not a mere suggestion. It's a fundamental aspect in our identity as Christians. Reflect on the love that God gives you and extend that same love to other people. In doing so, we get to participate in the redemptive work of Jesus and bear witness to his transformative love. Just like he changed you, you get to see that love affect other people's lives in a positive way. Lesson two, walk in the true light. Challenge yourself to live in the awareness of Christ as the true light. Allow his light to illuminate every corner of your life, dispelling those dark areas that still exist of sin and fear and doubt. As we walk in the light, we not only experience the freedom and the joy found in Christ, but also we become beacons of guiding lights to other people to guide them back to the source of that eternal light. John 3, verse 19 to 21 says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God or in layman's terms, so that all of you can understand it, if what you're doing in your private time would bring you shame in public, it's probably time to stop doing it in your private time. Because what you hide in the dark are the things you don't want to come to light, and if the light ever came to them, you wouldn't feel too good about it. So handle those dark parts of your life by letting the light in now before the light exposes it for you. Lesson three, let love be the proof of light. Examine your heart, examine your relationships, and think if there's any darkness that is lingering inside you. If we claim to be in the light, but we hold disdain or hatred for one of our brothers and sisters, deal with it. Let love be the distinguishing mark of your life as a follower of Christ. Don't stumble or give yourself the ability to by holding on to tensions and disagreements and disdain for other people. Be the Bible that unbelievers get to read and be an example to the world. Be a light in a world of darkness. Or to wrap it up and put a bow on it, let me get that map up here behind me and the lights down one more time. If you are in New Jersey and you are a single beam of light and you show that light to three people and you give them a piece of it and those three people show it to three people and those people show it to three people, eventually you end up looking like this part of the map because you didn't keep the light to yourself. Or you could be the type of Christian who says, you know what, I'm good, I'm saved, I know Jesus, and you go live in New Mexico where you just keep that single light to yourself and don't wanna share it. And that's the whole point I'm trying to make is you want to be New Jersey, you don't wanna be New Mexico. You wanna share the light and let the light thrive and allow it to go and go and go and go so that everybody on earth can see the transformative power of Jesus and not just sit with your light of assured salvation all by yourself and think, well, why bother? I'm good. Because how we love people is a litmus test for how we love God. Let's turn the lights back up. Everybody close your eyes and bow your head. I want to pray with y'all. Jesus, I ask that anybody who has any darkness in their hearts is holding on to any disdain, any hatred. God, that you would allow the light to shine over those dark places. For anybody who has any vices or any issues or any things that they're trying to hide in the dark, God, that you allow them to deal with it with you before the light exposes it. God, we pray that you fix everyone's heart posture in this moment. Allow them to embrace the commandment of love. Allow them to walk in true light and allow them to let that love be the proof of the light inside themselves. God, if they are a Christian in this room and they have not witnessed, they have not shared, they have not told the world about the love that they have for Jesus, let today be the day that that changes. Let them go out and witness. Let them spread the gospel. Let them tell other people about the light that changed them so they can hand that light off and allow that light to shine through somebody else. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, amen. You see, guys, those of you in here that are Christians, you've received this light, you've received this power, you've received this ability, you've received the Holy Spirit. And what I do on stage every single week is I share the light that Jesus gave me. I have a stage and a microphone, but we are no different. 
What I am doing for you, you can do for your friends, you can do at your school, you can do in your sport, and many of you have. And inviting people to come to the house is part of that process, and I appreciate you. But for any of you in the audience who don't have that relationship, who don't have that light, who may not understand exactly what this relationship with this guy named Jesus is that I've been talking about for the last 25 minutes, I'm gonna sum it up for you, and then we're all gonna pray together. You see, Jesus gave us a way to be imperfect, and be treated perfect. We all make mistakes. Raise your hand if you've never lied. Nobody raised their hand. Raise your hand if you've never sinned. Nobody raised their hand. We are all imperfect people. We all make mistakes. But because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we have a way to get to God that we don't deserve. We are forgiven when we don't deserve it. We are allowed to go to heaven even though we don't deserve it. We couldn't earn it, but it's okay. And it's not like God put us on trial heard our charges and said, I'm gonna find you not guilty. It's like he took away the court case. It's like we never stood trial. It's like we were never found guilty because we were forgiven before we ever sinned by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's very simple. Romans 10 verse nine says, in the most simple way, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's the only step in the process. I love that y'all come here. I love that you read your Bible. I love that you show up to church on Sundays. I love that you listen to worship music, but none of those things equal salvation. The only thing that does is letting Jesus into your heart and beginning a relationship with him. So right now I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads again. And we're gonna pray something called the sinner's prayer. And this prayer has no power on its own. This prayer is words on a page and words on our lips, but if there's a transformation in your heart when you say these words for the first time and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, I'm gonna ask for three seconds of bravery on the back end of this prayer. But we're all gonna pray out out loud. We're all gonna pray together. And I ask that you repeat after me. Say, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and there's nothing I can do to save myself. I know without you, There's no way for me to get to heaven. I believe that you died for my sins and my salvation. I believe you rose again and ascended to heaven. As best as I can, I transfer my trust to you. I know I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I give you my life. I receive your life. Now teach me how to live. And keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We all prayed that out loud, but if you prayed it and felt in your heart a beckoning to begin a relationship with Jesus, don't let the enemy sow fear. Don't let the enemy sow doubt. You don't need to know it all. You should have questions. The only difference is you're saying, yes, I am choosing Jesus and I want to begin this race of life with him in my corner. If that was you today, I'm gonna count to three. And when I say three, with everyone's eyes still closed and everyone's head still bowed, I just want you to raise your hand. Why? Not for me, but so I can identify you and help you take your next few steps as you begin this relationship with Jesus. But this is a moment between you and him. Nobody's looking around, but don't let the enemy punk you out. If you prayed those words and you felt his presence and you felt that pull, when I say three, I ask you to raise your hand straight up in the air. One, two, three. Three. All right, put those hands down. Everybody, heads up, eyes open. Let's hear a round of applause. We had salvations in the house tonight. I love it. I love it. I love it, man. Y'all don't know how much this fills me. I have the greatest job in the freaking world getting to be a part of this.